Well, praise God. Let's continue this morning. And uh, man, last week was really powerful. And uh, wow, so many people touched. And um, if you missed last week, I encourage you to to listen on SoundCloud and or watch on YouTube. But um, it's just one of those moments when God just moves. And uh, we're just so thankful for what he does. We're thankful when he shows up in power. We're, we're thankful when he releases impartation to people. We're thankful for the, even when he does weird stuff, right? I'm looking at you, Jenny. And uh, <laughs> it's all right. Sometimes God does unusual stuff, and he's just like, hey, I'm not going to fit in your box. And I'm bigger than that, amen, and that's unusual, and, and uh, so we just are, are thankful. So I want to continue, and that was a real message about the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the life of a believer, and, and we're going to touch on that again today, but kind of looking at the other end of the spectrum, amen, as we're continuing this series on discipleship, hallelujah, and spiritual formation and what that looks like, and so First of all, as we're talking about formation and discipleship, remember that when you talk about spiritual formation, and that's a really fancy word, isn't it? Doesn't that sound like something really fancy? Okay, it sounds nice. Uh, But it basically means formation is that, you know, and we're all going to experience spiritual formation in our lives. One way or the other, you will experience some type of spiritual formation, right? Right? And, you know, that's people sometimes are like, well, I'm just going to let my kids um, just receive whatever they want and they can make their decisions when they get old enough. No, you as a parent have a call to introduce and produce spiritual formation in their lives. Otherwise, social media is going to be what causes spiritual formation in their life, right? You guys are very aware that we're fighting a real spirit of slumber in the United States right now. And I don't know if you saw, I posted an article and there's a documentary out about what's happening in the nation of Iran right now. And I know many of you read that. Iran is experiencing a revival and an awakening. And, um, and it's all centering around what I'm talking about today, which is discipleship. And it's being led by women. And the mosques are being emptied. But one thing that really stood out to me in that article, and I haven't watched those documentaries. I'd love to do that at some point. But there was an Iranian couple that got born again, and they moved to the United States. And the wife told the husband, she said, you have to move me back to Iran because there's a spirit of slumber in the United States, and I feel like I'm falling asleep. And I would rather live in Iran in an Islamic nation than experience what I'm experiencing in the United States. So I say that to us. Part of what was coming forth this morning was being awakened by the love of God because we have to be awake to the purposes of God, right? And we're warring against something in the spirit that wants to wrap us and lull us to sleep in something other than what the Holy Spirit is saying and other than what the kingdom of God is wanting to do and what Jesus is wanting to produce in all of our lives, Amen. So I say that to say uh, we're very called to be spiritually formed by what Jesus wants to produce in our lives. Amen. So that means growing in our relationship with God. Amen. Learning to hear his voice more clearly. Can we always learn to grow in hearing the voice of God? Absolutely. Right. I thank God that I hear his voice, but I want to hear his voice more clearly. Amen. Especially when there is a spirit of slumber that's being released in the earth and in this nation. Uh, and and we, I read that and I thought, man, I just thought it was Ardmore. It's bigger than just Ardmore, right? Now, that's something we war against here. But it's in our nation and we must war about it, war against it. So, And uh, formation means continually renewing our mind to his, right? Because we're constantly being bombarded with culture and things that are not godly and that are not kingdom of God, that are not Jesus, amen, and it's wanting to conform our mind, amen, and so there's that war and we have to be aware of that. Now, there's also, and I'm really going to talk about this a lot today, discipleship, okay, and uh, what discipleship looks like. We have a call to be disciples, right? 
we have a call that we would be those that not just know about Jesus, that not just recite a prayer, but that are actually following him, right? And so discipleship means um, following Jesus, following what he taught, amen, and spreading the gospel he preached accompanied by power, okay? And it's being conformed to him not only in our character, but also in our ministry and how we minister. You can't have one without the other. We have to have that character formation, but we also have to understand that we're in the kingdom, and it is our call and our responsibility to see the kingdom of God come, increase, take root, and grow throughout the earth. Amen. That we have a call individually and corporately in our lives. So, and, uh, so we're going to talk about discipleship and the call that we all have to discipleship. Amen. So let's look at discipleship in the New Testament. And, you know, it, a lot of times disciple doesn't sound like a very fun word, does it? Because it kind of is related to discipline. Oh my gosh. And boy, we don't like that word in American culture right now. And we like it even less in the church. Right? We hate discipline. Let's just let's just live in the glory. And I like the glory. I like living in the glory. I like getting drunk in the spirit. Man, come on, I love it. I like fire tunnels, I like crazy stuff, I like miracles, I like glory clouds and all that. I love it, and I think that should be the normal because Christianity is supernatural. But do you understand there's a reality of the Christian life that revolves around discipline and being discipled? Oh, we don't like that. Because, you know, there's an element of Christianity because, you know, there's so much right now about grace, grace, grace. Grace, grace, grace. I love grace. Right? I love it. I'm thankful that I've received it in my life. I love grace and I want more grace, but grace is not an excuse. Grace is actually an empowerment that enables us to do everything that he's called us to do. But grace, which is powerful and overwhelming, works with actually effort in your life. Right? Hallelujah, man. This is good. Let's talk about what a disciple is, okay? The word disciple, if this person is right, where I got my information, please, praise God, is found 269 times in the New Testament. The word Christian is found three times. And it, began, it was used to signify when a moment when, okay, these guys aren't just some random Jewish sect, right? We can't just call them some weird branch off of Judaism anymore. They're Christians. They are Christ-like. They're little Christ. And I don't dislike the word Christian. I dislike what it's come to mean in some circles. But if you want to say literally that I'm Christ-like, I like that. I'm all about that, okay? But, you know, discipleship was the core and the emphasis of the New Testament. And the New Testament is a book about disciples, for disciples, and written by disciples of Jesus Christ, by followers of him. Now, a disciple literally just, just simply means to be a follower of a teacher or a leader, right? People called Jesus rabbi, and that was just another way of saying he's a teacher, okay? And we understand, we've talked about that a lot. But when you followed a rabbi in New Testament times, basically you, you went with them wherever they went. You, you listened to their teaching. And this is where sometimes we miss it in America because we've gotten so fat and lazy in America. <laughs> and we just keep stuffing ourselves with podcasts, and books, and YouTube, and we don't do what we've been instructed to do. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. 
I mean, I was convicted this week. I had to write a paper about this. Okay, and I made a 100, I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Professor Falco. Um, <laughs> but there's this reality of, you know, we a, a rabbi poured into those that followed them. And it wasn't just what they taught that, that people listened to, but they would emulate the rabbi in everything that they did. I'm going to not just listen to the rabbi, but I'm going to act like the rabbi. I'm going to do what the rabbi did, and everything that he's poured into me, he's making me in his image. And that's what discipleship actually looks like that we're following Jesus, we're being conformed to his image. And there's something that's happened in America in the last years and that's not good because we have actually begun to think that we can be Christians without obeying God. There is nothing in Scripture that says obedience is optional. But in America now, we're like, oh, grace, grace, grace. Grace, grace, grace. I don't really have to obey him. I don't really have to follow him. Because I walked an aisle or said a prayer or even went bab- or was baptized or grandma was a Sunday school teacher, and I'm good. And I, I am not being conformed to him, and that's okay. Do you know what that's producing in the American church right now? A spirit of slumber, right? Where people who have been radically converted and living in a culture where they're risking their lives, they come in and they're like, I would rather live in a culture of persecution than live in a place where there's slumber. That's humbling. That's convicting, and it scares me a little bit that we're living in this manner. Now, at the same time, I sense God doing incredible things, and there is a hungry remnant, and it's bigger than a remnant. Didn't you love that that Fox News did an article on Bethel? Is that awesome? And that there, it was just all about um, the simplicity of loving Jesus and how that it produces revival and it pours over and begins to impact the culture and that Reading, this out of the way town, city because it really is out of the way, it's hard to get to Reading a a, a city of 100,000 people has a church with over 10,000 people in it It's, it's radically changing that whole region amen, and and, you know so there's great hope for America, right? There's incredible things that Jesus is doing when we just say, God, I, I'm, Jesus, I'm just going to follow you. I'm going to follow you, right? And, and I, 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 you know, it, I, I pray that one day, we don't have to be on Fox News. Heck, well, they can even put us on CNN if they want to. That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> or even MSNBC, right? Wow, that'd be miraculous if they did a positive article on revival. Hallelujah. Sorry, y'all, my political colors are showing, but, you know, hallelujah. No, don't get political, Andy. Um, praise God. You just <laughs> but, you know, Jesus, he talked, he, whenever he called people, He came to them, and you know what he said to them? Follow me. And every time he said, follow me, often, not every time, but often, and often it's implied, there were actually conditions that he put on people. And sometimes they were really hard conditions, and sometimes he was like, when he'd come and say to people, follow me, they, they usually just immediately leave what they were doing and go after him. And he said, you know, if you want to come after me, and I'll just read this out of 
out of Luke 9, 23, he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If you want to follow me, if you want to come after me, you got to deny yourself. But you know what? It's not hard to do that when you're training sickness and sorrow and pain for joy and glory and peace and righteousness and forgiveness. It's not a hard trade. Well, do I want to stay in the kingdom of darkness? And do I want to be oppressed and scared? Or do I want to walk in freedom? And Jesus is saying, you know, now it doesn't mean we won't be persecuted and we won't be difficulty because sometimes life is crazy. Right, but there's that divine exchange where he's like, man, follow me, deny yourself what you want, what you desire, because what I have is greater. And take up your cross, which is an instrument of death, And follow me. But it's still just the best. Right? And it's so wonderful that an Iranian couple was like, man, I'd rather live in the persecution than live in the comfort. And sometimes that, ugh, that feels, a, we're like, what? What? If that causes us to struggle, it means we're probably coming under the influence of a seductive spirit that wants to affect how we think. Right? And that thing comes against all of us, right? Because we live in it. And often, when you're living under something, you don't realize what you're living under because of your culture, because of oppression, and because of those things, right? All right. So let's talk about biblical man, the biblical mandate versus, um, I've already been touching on this, but current church culture, right? Wow, this is kind of a hard message. Oh, my goodness. Um, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, uh, which is obviously the Great Commission. Amen. And, you know, it's one of the last things that Jesus said in his earthly ministry to his followers before he departed. So generally, when your last words are important, right? And Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples. Did he say make church members? No. Go and I'm for church, y'all, obviously. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus said, hey, boys and ladies, right? he said, everything that I poured into you these last three years as you walked with me and you we walked together and we had friendship together and and I loved you, and I, I even brought correction, and I modeled all these things to you, and all this that we did. Now, you go, and because you're my disciples, you go, and you duplicate the process. And you find people that are going to be discipled, and you pour into them, and you reproduce what I produced in you, right? And that's how you reach the nations. Now, we've kind of, you know, you know, and the, the result of that, what? What was the result of that? Was incredible, incredible, explosive growth of Christianity in the kingdom. And right, there's, and I can't remember who wrote it. I've read it several times over the years, but it was someone speaking. He'd written something to the Romans, and he said, uh, we as Christians have, have penetrated every part of society. There are slaves, there are people in the Senate, there are merchants. Christianity has so penetrated and permeated the Roman culture 
that your gods are no more. And that's what happened, right? And, and all those Roman gods that they followed, they began to close down. It's what's happening in Iran right now because they recognize that Jesus was greater and all the false gods, all those things, were, sh- were they, they were like, Jesus is greater. He's greater. He's healing people. His followers are are healing people. They're casting out devils that we don't know how to get rid of. Okay. They begin to recognize that Jesus was greater. Amen. And so Christianity exploded. Amen. Now, today the focus is a little bit backwards because first, when they moved in discipleship, okay, when they begin to move in that, the result was explosive growth. Well, here's what we want to do in America today. We've got it backwards. We want explosive church growth without discipleship. And I got, I'm not against mega churches and all that. I'm for it. I hope one day we're a mega church. Why not? Right? Why not? I think we're the best church in town. And I bless all the other churches. But if I didn't think we were the blessed church in, best church in town, I'd go somewhere else. <laughs> so discipleship is what Jesus commanded us to do. Amen. And and he and so, you know, discipleship, we we need to ask ourselves the question Am I a disciple of Christ? Or am I a Christian by current standards? Am I a disciple of Christ? Or am I a Christian by current standards? What does that look like? What does it look to be like to be a disciple of Christ? Amen. And, you know, part of it is because the church, the modern church has really made discipleship impossible. Because we ha- we've made converts and not disciples. And it's, we've made it where we're, we're not, we haven't taught how to live as Christ lived. Right? And so that, that has to shift now part of it is because and I touched on this three or four weeks ago what what happened in Protestant Christianity right was this thing of if you just believe the right doctrine they're collapsing back there right if you just believe the right doctrine you're fine you can't believe this doctrine, it's wrong. So as long as you have faith, which means a mental allegiance to certain doctrines and beliefs, you're good. Isn't it weird when you see people win awards at award shows and they're some of the most ungodly people that you've ever seen? Man, and they come on and they're like, I'm keeping the faith. And you're like, cover your nipple. Jamie's upset because I said nipple, but, you know, (laughs) twice. But come on, y'all, let's be honest. You know, and (laughs) y'all thought it, right? Come on, y'all read worse stuff. Some of you are scrolling through worse stuff on Facebook right now. His phone's on the floor. He's good. (laughs) Right? And you've got people who are living very ungodly lives, and they're like, well, because I believe the right thing, I can influence a generation. Right? And, And they might even do a Christian album, but they'll leave their booty call song off on their country album instead of their Christian one. You 
It's a quarter after whatever, da, 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 and I need you now. Oh, but she got a Christian album. Let God's will be done. Well, a booty call probably wasn't his will. Come on, y'all. Now, y'all, I'm believing that people like Justin Bieber, man, who led worship for the first time, the destiny that's on his life, I pray that it comes forth. I pray that the gatherings that Kanye's leading right now, but that he'll get rid of the new age that's intermingling that and bring the truth. So even though some of this is happening and we're like, God, I don't know about this, we need to pray that the purity, and I don't want to turn my back on those people, right? Because God's wanting to do something, right? And there, we've got prophets right now having all these prophetic dreams. Jeremiah Johnson had a prophetic dream about how God's going to use Trump, Kanye, and Justin Bieber. Do it, Lord. Right? Do it. Today. Right? <laughs> she says, today. Yeah. And I, I, I want that, y'all. Okay? But, man, I am way off. Um, right? <laughs> but, there, <laughs> but there's this thing where it's not just believing the right thing, but that our hearts are being conformed to him in righteousness, right? And we've, we've got to find out, Lord, just because something is culturally okay right now, and, oh, you can be a Christian and do this and this, and that's not what Jesus said, right? And it really, I'm not trying to emphasize morality, though that's a big part. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that we're being conformed to him. It's the heart, Right? It's the heart that turns towards him. Amen. And so, but here's the thing that we have to focus on. Discipleship is intentional. It is very intentional. And we've so lived in this whole greasy grace that I can do whatever I want and God's got me. And he does, but a lot of times we just like, God, I really need you to show up now. Lord, and I'm praying now, it's been a year, but Jesus, <laughs> that's not discipleship. Now, thank God that in his grace and his mercy, it's greater than mine. It's greater than yours. Aren't you glad? Right? But there's this, there's this thing of discipleship that has to become very intentional, that it involves intentional pursuit and disciplined action. Again, we're back to that D word. Disciplined action, right? I'm going to make a comment here, and I've, I've made this before. You know, because we're going to talk for just a few minutes about spiritual disciplines. Grace is opposed to earning, not to effort. You can't earn grace, okay? But grace is not opposed to our effort. Grace actually energizes our effort. And if you can't put out some intentional spiritual discipline, you will not grow. And you will not be a disciple. Now listen, as I said earlier, man, I love impartation. Woo, I love it. I, lo I love the thought that God can zap me, that Randy Clark can lay hands on me, and I'm just like Randy, and I've got his ministry. Or Bill Johnson can lay hands on me, and I'm just like him. I've got his anointing. Now, 
Spiritual impartation is real, right? Or Heidi can lay hands on me and I can have the same experience that she did where I feel like I'm on fire for six days and then I go back and the government puts a hit on me. Wait, I don't want that. But there's this thing in Christianity right now, if I can just get impartation, I've arrived. I 100% believe in impartation. You know it. I believe it, right? But you don't know, you do in a little bit because you've been in this church, when some of those people got their impartations, what they had to walk through the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the prices that they pay every day, that they keep the Lord before them, right? They keep the Lord before them when, when a thousand members leave Bethel Church because they don't like the move of the Spirit. Right? Well, go home and binge Netflix then. Right? Or, or Heidi has to deal with the government taking away everything that she has and she's putting 350 children in tents after the Lord told her that they'd raise up thousands of churches. Or Randy being a part of one of the greatest moves in history and him getting kicked out of his movement. Because John Wimber didn't think it was the Lord. You don't know the spiritual disciplines that people walk through every day. I mean, I see people who are like, man, I want to be an apostle. I want to be a prophet. No, you don't. You have no idea what you're asking for. If you don't have the grace for that, don't touch it because you will be destroyed. But if you have the grace and you have the call for that, then you better have some spiritual discipline in your life because you will never, never. Many are called, but few are chosen. Uh Uh-oh. There's a lot of calls out there. But until we say, Jesus, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at you and I'm going after you, and there's spiritual discipline in my life, I'll never step into that call. Let's talk about some spiritual disciplines. Right? I've got a quote here from a guy named Dallas Willard. I had to read his book this week. He's a crazy Baptist. He's not alive anymore. But I guess he was too crazy. No. (laughs) But he said, It is well-directed, decisive, and sustained effort that is the key to the keys of the kingdom and to the life of restful power in ministry and life. Those keys open that up. Isn't that funny that he says it's well-directed, decisive, and sustained effort that produces restful power? Well, the Lord's just called me to rest right now. I know you don't understand it. No, I don't, because it's not biblical. Now, do I believe in rest and... And, and the Sabbath and all those things. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it in a minute and destroy some religious paradigms. Well, hurry up, she says, right? <laughs> but before we do that, let's read Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. This is a good one that we have to read sometimes. Now, I actually had someone tell me once that that prayer was a work and they didn't need to do it because Jesus delivered us from all works. It's a work of the flesh to pray. (laughs) That's what I said. You know, I was like, well, you know, Jesus prayed a lot. And he said, well, Jesus was our example. Or or no, he said, he said, Jesus was our, um, how did he put it? He was our sacrifice, not our example. But that's, that's, you guys, that is a common set of beliefs that is out there right now. Right? And so here in Ephesians 2, 
verses 8. And, you know, when you read Scripture, you know, you always need to read Scripture around it. You do know that, right? Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Praise God. Aren't you thankful that salvation is a gift and you don't have to earn it? However, and again, it's as not as a result of works that no one should boast. But then the scripture goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You're, you were created for good works in Christ Jesus. I mean, grace came so that you could be saved, so that you could be energized for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And God's like, man, I've got a plan. I'm going to pour out radical grace because I've got good works for Martha. Right? God's like, I've got some radical grace for Michael and Stacy. And he's got radical grace because he's got, I've got works. And those works don't, I mean, generally that usually means miraculous things. You do realize that. But there's also spiritual disciplines, works, that because grace is opposed to earning, not to effort. Right? Here's some spiritual disciplines, and this is by no means an inclusive list. These are just a few things. Service. The S word. We've got churches now who won't even call their meetings services. It's an experience. Because service sounds really religious. We might have to serve. Yeah, that's a spiritual discipline. Jesus is among you as the servant of all. He washed the disciples' feet so that they might do the same thing. Serve one another. You want to get some character formed in your life? Serve people. Right? Oh, my gosh. Maybe even people you don't like. That's a hard one, isn't it? So, y'all, I'm in spiritual formation right now. I'm just saying. Right? We're all in that. We're all going through that. Fellowship. Fellowship sometimes requires discipline and intentional effort. Worship. Right? Study. Another S word. <laughs> Knowing the word and sometimes even beyond just a surface reading, actually requires some study. These next ones are fun. These next ones really convicted me. Solitude, silence, and fasting. Did you know solitude and silence were often disciplines of the early church? And some of us can't even get through a worship service and stay off our phone. I'm convicting myself. You know, one of the greatest moments of, of our trip on our ocean cruise, and oh, thank you, Jesus, I'm feeling a call back to the water. I feel it, Lord. You're calling me to the restful places. You're leading me besides the still waters, right? But you know, and you guys heard me talk about this, we chose not to get the internet package. And I was just like, Jesus, I don't know. I got some Facebook followers that they need to be updated. Man, they want to see me in my Speedo by the, by the pool. I got a jelly roll, but I got followers. Marshall's my one follower because <laughs> he thinks it's hilarious, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> too far, too far, right? <laughs> I've been gone too far, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know what? We didn't have we we did get an internet one day because Jamie had to push her shoe dazzle or something. I don't know what she's doing, right? <laughs> if I don't change this, I get hundred and fifty dollars worth of wedges, right? So we had to do something like that, you know. <laughs> Jesus help us, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was important. I was like, yeah, we're going to get internet. We're going to change that. <laughs> but, you know, we didn't have internet for four or five days, and it was the most ref- restful, refreshing. I, I felt like a part of my soul was recharged. Because, you know, I didn't come away saying, can you believe what they're doing? Can you believe what she posted? Who does she think she is? You know, but there was an element. Now, we, did, we didn't just stay in our cabin silent, you know. <laughs> but there was an element of solitude and silence that pulled us away from the confusion and the chaos of living. And there's an, actually an element of Sabbath in that. Because there, a Sabbath is, you know, in the Old Testament, it was taking a whole day out of the week not to do any work and it was once every seven years the land rested and do you understand how much faith that required how many of you could say when you're being overwhelmed in your work oh I've got to take one day and not work (laughs) or man, I can't grow crops this year. I have to be dependent on the sixth year that they would be double. And so I, I, I can't leave my phone out of prayer time because someone may need me. Or I'm getting notifications on that swell post I just made, and I want to see who all they are. Swell. It's so out that it's in. Right, <laughs> I brought it. I'm bringing. I'm bringing swell back. I'm swole. Right, um, so I. <laughs> so, and everybody's like, "Now that's out." Right, <laughs> if my dad just said it or the pastor, it's out. Right, but you know, there's this element of trust and him and trusting him and and coming aside and you know I. You know, I've got a professor who every morning she gets up and spends about two hours with the Lord. In the first hour, she sits in silence. At 4 a.m., if I was sitting in silence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm in silence in the Word right now. My bed's the Word, right? <laughs> but there's something about because you know what we we've so trained ourselves to be constantly entertained i got some time oh what what new netflix series is there you know or you know we're so trained to be entertained and entertainment and fun that's great but there are moments when god's saying man come away in silence and so this morning I was like, I can't preach this if I'm not going to do it. So I, I was up early, and I was sitting out on this greened-in back porch, and the sun was coming up, and the wind was blowing. And so I, I left my phone in the house, and I sit out, and the wind was blowing, and I just started meditating on the Lord, thinking on things. And you know what started rolling up in me were scriptures I had memorized. Another lost discipline the memorization of Scripture, because you know how we often keep the Lord before us? His memorizing and His Word just starts rolling up in me. And just that phrase about blessing and glory and honor be to Him who sits on the throne. May the knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And I was just meditating about it, and it just kept rolling up on me, and it wasn't even conscious it just was because I I didn't have anything in front of me besides my dog and he was you know you know he was asleep and and the and it was so weird and it was as the more that that rolled up in me the stronger the wind got and it just crescendoed and I was just like 
I think I just had an experience. I felt his glory in the quietness. And there's something about solitude and silence and even the F word, fasting. Because those all have to do with a modern day Sabbath where we're trusting in the Lord to meet us. And we've become so busy. We all have busy lives, but what would it look like if we just set aside and didn't come to get the next word, the next revelation, the next intercession? And there are, trust me, there are moments to get those. But we would just come and say, God, I'm just putting my heart on you right now. Putting my heart on you and the quietness and the solitude. I promise you, if you try it, you're going to struggle. I'm just going to tell you right now. Don't think that you're not spiritual when you sit down and you're just like, maybe if I got another cup of coffee, it'd help. Yeah, I think that would help. But focusing on him, that <laughs> that discipline, that's, that focus, that's a Sabbath. Saying, God, I, I, I'm keeping you before me. Amen. I challenge you to try that this week. And it doesn't have to be long. I did it for 15 minutes. The first two minutes were agony. (laughs) Because that's how we are. Some of us are like Ricochet Rabbit. (sighs) I can't sit still. (laughs) Right? Some of us aren't. Some of us got that beat, right? But, but, and, and our focus on him. Right, that looked a little too Tommy Boy, but um, <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I got charged by that fifteen minutes of silence. <laughs> right, it did something in me, and, and you know, practice those disciplines because that's where spiritual formation comes. And impartation, as wonderful as it is, cannot take the place of those things. You know, I I preached last week about the early church and how they were transformed on the day of Pentecost. I preached about uh, um, Heidi and her experience and how she was transformed. I preached on Smith Wigglesworth and how, you know, he couldn't even speak publicly. And when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit, suddenly he's preaching and his wife, Polly, was like, Smith is a different man. Because impartation, baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, a a fresh feeling those things can actually change aspects of our personality but you know what I found in my life is generally when I've received an impartation or an experience that God gives me something and I have to steward and grow what he's given me because I know a lot of people who've had incredible encounters and they walk away and they never fulfill or they never grow and they never move into what God has. But then I know people who are like, man, I had that encounter with the Lord and I took what he gave me in seed form and I planted it and I watered it every day and I tended to it every day. And it, when it started growing, I was like, oh, oh, look, there's a blade. I'm going to tend the blade. I'm not going to despise the small gin- beginning or they take the apple that God gives them. Well, remember years ago when God said, you can have an apple or you can have an orchard. Which one do you want? You can take the apple and you can eat it and you can consume it. Or you can take that apple and you can plant the seeds in it and you'll have an orchard. If you just take what I give you in those moments and in discipline and in intentional pursuit, grow something that will change everything. Because it really is in the quiet moments. It really is in the daily, mundane moments where we choose Him. You know, the moments when we have a great guest speaker, and suddenly everybody's a committed member of Global Harvest. Everybody waving their freak flag. 
Woo! Glory! Woo! Woo! I'm falling out. But what do you do when you get up? What do you do when the special meeting's over? Do you live in what you received? And do you tend it? And do you grow it every day? Sometimes in the moments when there's no glory cloud, no signs and wonders, when you just say, Jesus, it's just you and me. I don't have a prophetic word to put on Facebook today. Elijah List probably ain't going to run it. But Lord, it's you and me. And in these moments, I keep you ever before my face. I stirred what you've given me. And then suddenly, a year, five years later, maybe ten years later, maybe a lifetime later, I don't know. The thing that you pursued just happens, and everybody thinks you had breakthrough. But breakthrough usually happens in the quiet moments when we give effort and discipline. This is a convicting message, y'all. But this is a word to the American church. It's a word to us. It's a word to me. I don't preach things that I don't say, okay, God, how can I live this in greater measure? How can this become part of the fabric of my life? Sounds like a good commercial jingle or something, right? But, but that intentional pursuit every day. So here's what, I, here's what I really want you guys to do today and this week. First of all, commit to become a disciple. No matter where we are in our lives, no matter where we are. And you know, don't you love it that grace can meet you wherever you are? And when we combine our faith, our belief, our pursuit with grace, we become energized to do it. We say, God, I, I'm going to be a disciple today. Not just today, I'm going to be a disciple tomorrow on Monday morning. Monday mornings, it's hard to be a disciple, y'all. Right? Or I'm going to be a disciple Friday night. Right? But I, ch- challenge yourself with some of these spiritual disciplines. Let the Lord lead you, but be intentional when he leads you. Try solitude. Try some solitude, even if it's 10 minutes. Right? Like I said, the first two were hard. You know what my goal was this morning? Y'all are gonna laugh. It was ten minutes of solitude. The first two. Maybe I should practice my Spanish lesson, right? Because I do that every morning, right? We're we're so weird in our house. We study languages, right? We're geeks. So, um, not Jamie Dunn, right? But she's got to cancel her wedges, right? <laughs> but then 10 minutes in, I was like, oh, Lord, I'm not canceling anything. 10 minutes in, I'm like, oh, there's, ooh, this is nice. And I went another 15, right? Practice solitude. Practice some scripture memorization. And, you know, sit in those moments and think about that scripture. And just ponder it and chew on it and reflect on it. You don't have to go into a time of prayer with your Christmas list. There are times for that. There are times that God does that. But sometimes in prayer, or God, you got to give me the next word. Maybe we need that, but sometimes it's like, God, I just want to be with you. I just want to be conformed to you because I've been in your presence. Right? Practice some scripture memorization and pondering some of those things. And just say, you know, Lord... The Christian life is really about becoming conformed to you. You're the teacher. You're the master. You're the rabbi. You're Lord. And, you know, sometimes teacher's not a popular term. We all respect teachers and all that, but we emphasize the apostle and the prophet and all that. But Jesus was a teacher, too. In teaching, he he imparted things that conformed people. So 
in your quest for discipleship this week, say, Lord, touch me as the teacher, as the rabbi, as Lord. I want to be like you. I want to be a disciple. Amen. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. So, Lord, I thank you today. I thank you that, Lord, I thank you what the Holy Spirit does. I thank you that there are moments that he comes in suddenly in great power, great authority, and great fire. And Lord, we, we need that. But, Lord, Lord, I thank you that you also meet us through the Holy Spirit in moments where you're, you're shaping us into your image. You're conforming us. We're growing in grace. And, Lord, we, we need that every moment in our life. And so, Father, we want to be a house not only of revival and miracles, but, Lord, we want to be a house of disciples. We want to be a house of people. We want to be a family that's intentionally pursuing you. Lord, I thank you for, Lord, you've taught us to be a people of intimacy. Lord, I thank you for the intimate worship this morning and the exuberance and the joy. But, Lord, I, we just want to be a house of disciples. And, Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, you wouldn't just release conviction in a way that shames us, Lord, but a conviction that actually empowers us, Lord, and causes us to move closer to you today. And so, Father, I thank you for your grace. Lord, I just thank you that even right now there's just a, an outpouring of grace. Lord, it just feels like a fresh rain, a spring rain just coming upon this place today, Lord, and touching people's lives. Lord, we just receive the outpouring of that fresh rain today. Father, that grace that touches us all in our very innermost being, and Lord, that compels us to follow Jesus in a very practical, a very real manner. Thank you today, Lord, that you're meeting us. Lord, you're meeting us in the thunder. You're meeting us in the fire. But, Lord, I thank you that you're also meeting us in the stillness, in the solitude, and you're meeting us in your word. So, Father, thank you today. We honor you. We love you. We glorify you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let him do it. He wants to do it. Bless you guys. So good to see you today. Uh, if you need um, physical healing, we'll have a healing. No, sorry. Prophetic teams here. And if you need physical healing, we'll have a healing team over here. And remember, Steve and Marcy Fish tomorrow night at Supernatural School. Have a great week. Uh, and we'll see you guys sometime. Amen. God bless.